Hey guys, what's up? Happy Friday and welcome back. Thanks so much for tuning in this week for another episode of the B Music Reviews podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Musica. As always, we're going to analyze, review, and discuss the latest news and dive into the past regarding movies, music, video games, and much, much more. If you don't already, be sure to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at B Muse Reviews. And tune into the B Muse Reviews podcast each week on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, and all other streaming platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, we thank you so much for tuning in. Please be sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment below, and to hit the bell icon to receive notifications that informs you exactly when our podcast goes live, as well as all other video content. Also, be sure to visit our website at www.musicaprojects.com. There you will find all important links to our latest podcast episodes, new projects currently available, and also previews of those currently in development, along with our latest blog posts. If there's a question or a topic that you'd like us to discuss on the podcast, send them to bmusereviews at gmail.com with podcast question slash topic in the subject line. With all that out of the way, let's not waste any more time and get right to this week's news. Welcome everyone to the BMUs Reviews podcast. All right, and our first topic today, James Gunn and Peter Safran have been named co-chairs and co-CEOs of DC Studios. This news comes to us directly from CBR. DC has finally found its Kevin Feige, or two of them rather, in the form of James Gunn and Peter Safran. The Hollywood Reporter revealed that writer slash director Gunn and producer Safran will become co-chairs and co-CEOs of DC Studios. The new studio will replace DC Films at Warner Brothers Discovery, which is being shuttered following Walter Hamada's exit. Warner Brothers Discovery has spent months looking for an architect to oversee its comic book properties on the big and small screens in the hopes of replicating the success of Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige. Gunn will oversee the creative side of DC Studios, with Safran focusing on the business and production end. On top of their new duties, both creatives will continue working in their respective fields. Gunn and Safran will report directly to Warner Bros. Discovery CEO David Zaslav and work closely with Warner Bros. Pictures co-chairs and CEOs Michael DeLuca and Pamela Abdi. We're honored to be the stewards of these DC characters we've loved since we're children, Gunn and Safran said in a statement. We look forward to collaborating with the most talented writers, directors, and actors in the world to create an integrated, multi-layered universe that still allows for the individual expression of the artists involved. Our commitment to Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Harley Quinn, and the rest of the DC stable of characters is only equaled by our commitment to the wonder of human possibility these characters represent. We're excited to invigorate the theatrical experience around the world as we tell some of the biggest, most beautiful, and grandest stories ever told. Man, huge news. Absolutely huge breaking news. James Gunn and Peter Safran named co-chairs and co-CEOs of DC Studios. This is a big shakeup. And I got to tell you, I did not see this one coming. Um, James Gunn has been trending upward in terms of his responsibilities, the overall role that he's been playing at DC and Warner Brothers. But to be named co-chair and co-CEO along with Peter Safran today, wow. Wow. This is huge, and this is big. This is awesome for DC. This is really big for DC Studios, and this is what this is honestly what DC Studios has needed for the longest time. With the most recent success of Black Adam, Henry Cavill being confirmed as Superman coming back, and the sequel to Man of Steel currently being in development, 
and now James Gunn and Peter Safran being named co-chairs and co-CEOs of DC Studios. I'm telling you right now, DC Studios is in fine hands. This is awesome news. This news just broke not even an hour ago of this recording. And wow. I mean, I'm still shocked by this, but this is awesome. Kudos to Warner Brothers Discovery and DC Studios for naming their new co-chairs and co-CEOs and James Gunn and Peter Safran. The future is certainly bright with DC Studios, that's for sure. Awesome to see, and I cannot wait to see what future projects come our way. All right, and our next topic today, Real Cinema is closing down 12 locations across the United States. This news comes to us from Deadline. No surprise here, but we hear that Regal has shuttered 12 of its 542 multiplexes as parent company Cineworld remains in Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Those 12 include Anaheim Hills 14, Calabasas Stadium 6, West Park 8 in Los Angeles Market, Crow Canyon Stadium 6 in the San Francisco area, the Broadway Fair in Fresno, California, Richland Crossing Stadium in the Philly area, Parkway Plaza Stadium 12 in the Seattle-Tacoma market, Greenville Grand Stadium in North Carolina, Middleburg Town Square Stadium 16 in Cleveland, Akron, Sherwood Stadium 10 in, in Portland, Oregon, Colonnade Stadium 14 in Las Vegas, and the Amarillo Star Stadium 14 in Texas. Man, this really sucks to hear. I'm a really big fan of Regal Cinemas. Regal Cinemas is my personal favorite cinema uh, to visit. There's one very close to where we live, and uh, we visit it quite frequently. And we really enjoy being Regal Unlimited members as well. This really does suck to hear that the company uh, is forced to close down 12 of its locations. But unfortunately, that's business sometimes. And I know we talked about this story a few weeks ago on the podcast where Regal Cinemas' parent company... Cineworld had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and with the company still being in that process, seeing now these additional closures happening, it's really just unfortunate, but one that you really can't say is unexpected, ultimately, because of everything with the bankruptcy and everything that's really entailed. Ultimately, this is really unfortunate, and I hope that these locations are able to open up eventually, one day, maybe, but... We'll see. I mean, still having over 500 locations across the U.S. is still something to hang your hat on, and it's still positive. So, you know, it's always important to go to your local theaters and and support not only the movies and the the, the art that comes out, but the local cinemas as well. 99% of them that are open, they make their money mainly from refreshment sales, drink you know, drink sales, candy sales, you name it. So every time that I'm there. Well, first of all, I, I cannot watch a movie in a movie theater and not have a fruit punch with me. A fruit punch is a must. I cannot watch a movie in a theater and not have a fruit punch. So I'm at least going to be buying a fruit punch each time that I go to the theater, along with some candy, uh, most likely. So it's always important to, to support, like I said, not only the, the art that comes out and all the, the unique films that we get, we get an opportunity to see in theaters, but supporting the theaters themselves and buying refreshments, tickets to all the movies that we want to see. And it sucks reporting this news, but ultimately having a lot more theaters across the U.S. is still something, it's still a positive, like I said. And I have no doubts that this whole process with the company being in bankruptcy currently, that it'll get sorted and everything will be okay uh, when all said and done. But ultimately curious to know what your thoughts are. Are you a fan of Regal Cinemas? Have you ever been to a Regal Cinema? Are you a fan of a different cinema? If so, which one? Be sure to comment below if you're watching on YouTube. And as always, be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. All right, and our next topic today. The Ezra Miller drama continues. Shocker. <laughs> this news comes to us from NBC News. The Flash star Ezra Miller pled not guilty to burglary charges in a Vermont court. Miller, who is charged with burglary into an occupied home and petite larceny, faces up to 26 years in federal prison if convicted of both charges. Miller appeared in Bennington Superior Court virtually with their lawyer, 
The actor is accused of breaking into a residence in Stamford, Vermont on May 1st. After investigating at the time, Vermont State Police had discovered several missing bottles of alcohol from the property while the homeowners were not present. After collecting statements and reviewing surveillance footage, police charged Miller with felony burglary. The petit larceny charge states that the stolen items were less than $900 in value. The felony burglary charge has a maximum of 25 years in prison and a $1,000 maximum fine. The larceny charge is a maximum of one year and a similar $1,000 fine. Miller also agreed to not have any contact with the homeowner or return to the residence. Oy, oy, oy. Boy, oh boy, with Ezra. Ezra, what are you doing? Oh, man, from the karaoke chaos to threatening to burn people that you're staying with and why are you staying with other people in the first place and now and you're a supposed cult leader and you're supposedly uh you know accused of uh, grooming uh children and he's uh, now faces 26 years in federal prison if convicted of burglary and larceny charges oh my gosh it just doesn't end. Wow. And The Flash is supposed to be coming out this upcoming summer. Oh my gosh. I will be absolutely shocked if Ezra is anywhere near press when this movie goes. They may be in jail. <laughs> I don't... Who knows? This is just nonsense wow well there you have it just giving you the latest on the Ezra Chronicles and where that all stands be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts moving on here all right and switching gears real quick do some gaming news CD Projekt Red has officially confirmed a sequel to Cyberpunk 2077 this news comes to us from Polygon. CD Projekt Red has just announced a, a Cyberpunk 2077 sequel. The developer tweeted its long-term development plan Tuesday, sharing that we'll take the Cyberpunk franchise further and continue harnessing the potential of this dark future universe. CD Projekt Red's president and CEO said in a video published to YouTube that the next Three games in the developer's pipeline are based in the Witcher franchise, meaning that Cyberpunk 2077 sequel is well off in the future. He called the sequel an ambitious title that will require expanding CD Projekt Red's more than 1,200 person studio even further. The studio will open a new hub in Boston alongside its Vancouver location as CD Projekt Red North America. Wow, this is big news not only the sequel to cyberpunk 2077 but the expansion of cd project red in north america it's vancouver location and boston locations and they will be focusing specifically on this sequel and other future projects as well this is awesome still have not had the opportunity to play cyberpunk 2077 i don't know what i'm waiting for i know i know but I will get around to it, and when I do, I cannot wait to share, and we will be sure to stream it on YouTube, so be sure to check that out when it arrives. But with Cyberpunk 2077, knowing the hype around it and what it entails, being basically Grand Theft Auto set in like a Blade Runner setting, sign me up. I don't need to know anything about it. I will jump right into this. And now getting a sequel, and it's going to be quite ambitious. Knowing that it's quite a ways away, can only imagine what it's going to be like when it does arrive. But this is awesome news. Just wanted to make sure to share with all you guys. What are your thoughts? Have you had the chance to play Cyberpunk 2077? What were your thoughts if you did get a chance to play the game? If you haven't, you're like me. We have plenty of time before the sequel arrives. But no matter if you played the game or not, be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts on this news. All right, and our next topic today, 
Keanu Reeves and Todd Field have officially left Devil in the White City. This news comes to us from IGN. Keanu Reeves has reportedly stepped away from Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese's The Devil in the White City series for Hulu. As reported by Variety, Reeves will no longer be playing Burnham in the adaptation of the 2003 book by Eric Larson, which was due to be the first major television role of the actor's career. Shortly after the announcement, Variety reported that director Todd Field had also departed the project. The Devil in the White City is set in Chicago as Daniel Burnham struggles to create the 1893 World's Fair while serial killer H.H. Holmes, played by DiCaprio, plots to use it as a murder destination. DiCaprio committed to the role way back in 2009 and confirmation that Scorsese would direct came in 2015. Man, this really stink. This really is, uh, you know, this news really is quite unfortunate. And this may have come down to simply uh, just scheduling or maybe Keanu Reeves is no longer interested in the role. I have no idea. No additional news or details have come out about this, about Keanu Reeves' decision. But as the report stated, this was set to be the actor's very first major television role. And we will have to continue waiting for that. Uh, sometime in the future, it may come. We'll have to wait and see. But for right now, the actor does have John Wick Chapter 4 coming out soon. And many more projects as well. I know, uh, I think Keanu is at the helm of directing and also starring in a film adaptation of his own comic book, Berserker. So that might be a project that's taking up a good amount of his time. And he may just want to simply focus on that project right now. And that might be what caused him to leave uh, Devil in the Way City. Who knows? More details may arrive in the future. And if they do, we will be sure to discuss them here on the podcast. But for right now, what are your thoughts on this news? Be sure to write to us and let us know. All right, in our next topic today, Brendan Fraser is up for doing Mummy 4. This news comes to us from Screen Geek. With his role in The Whale, Brendan Fraser is officially back on the big screen and in the spotlight. As such, many fans might be hoping for a potential return to one of his previous roles. And luckily enough, Brendan Fraser says he's up for returning for The Mummy 4 if such a film were to happen. Fans will remember that Brendan Fraser played action hero Rick O'Connell in three different films between 1999 and 2008. The three films titled The Mummy, The Mummy Returns, and The Mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor have remained incredibly popular over the years. As such, it makes perfect sense that Hollywood might choose to revisit them at some point. So if that were to happen, Brendan Fraser revealed to Variety that he's definitely up to return. Here's what Brendan Fraser specifically had to say about returning for a potential Mummy 4. I don't know how it would work, but I'd be open to it if someone came up with the right conceit. He further explained that it takes a specific combination of elements to make a movie like The Mummy. This, he believes, is a reason why the unrelated 2017 Mummy film starring Tom Cruise did not succeed. Audiences will remember that particular film was intended to launch The Dark Universe, a cinematic universe for Universal's classic monsters, but the film was considered a flop. The entire project was canceled. As such, here's what Brendan Fraser shared. It's hard to make that movie. The ingredient that we had going for our mummy, which I didn't see in the Tom Cruise film, was fun. That was what was lacking in that incarnation. It was too much of a straight ahead horror movie. The mummy should be a thrill ride, but not terrifying and scary. Now, overall, I think for myself, having a little bit of horror elements and having it being a little terrifying, a little scary, is not necessarily a bad thing. I think having a little bit of darker elements it can be good. As long as the story is good and everything makes sense, I think that you're going to have a general sense of appeal. I do think that Brendan Fraser is correct, though, that uh, the movie should be a thrill ride and it should be uh, a fun adventure. And the, But ultimately, I think that came from what the story entailed. 
and if you had a little bit of darker elements to that too i don't think it would necessarily be bad at all though i think it would be honestly a more refreshing take a more of a different twist too to this series but ultimately hearing that he's up to do a mummy 4 that is pretty exciting growing up with these films i've been a huge fan of them ever since i was a little kid so to hear that this is even a possibility let's let it happen let's make it happen hollywood in the age of reboots and sequels I will take a Mummy 4 sequel any day of the week, that's for sure. Curious to know what your thoughts are, though. Have you seen the Brendan Fraser Mummy movies? If so, which is your favorite out of all three? Are you excited for the possibility of there being a Mummy 4 in the future? Be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. All right, and our next topic today. A John Candy documentary is currently in production. This news comes to us from Huffington Post. This past week, Canadian actor Ryan Reynolds announced that he and director Colin Hanks are set to release a documentary about the legacy of the fellow Canadian star through Reynolds' Maximum Effort Production Company. With John Candy trending, I'll just say I love him, Reynolds wrote on Twitter. So much so, Maximum Effort is working on a documentary on his life with Colin Hanks. Expect tears. The Deadpool star shared the news about the upcoming film after Candy began trending on Twitter ahead of the 4K re-release of 1987's Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. The pair's project is a full circle moment for Colin as his father, Tom Hanks, previously worked with Candy on Splash in 1983 and Volunteers in 1985. Reynolds previously tapped into the world of documentaries after producing and narrating 2011's The Whale a film about a killer whale living in Nootka Sound, Canada, who was separated from his pod at a young age. Throughout the 80s and 90s, Candy was a household name, earning his stripes as a comedy legend. In May 1994, he died at the age of 43 from a heart attack in his sleep while filming Wagons East in Durango, Mexico. During his Hollywood career, he starred in many popular comedy films such as Uncle Buck in 1989, National Lampoon's Vacation in 1983, Spaceballs in 1987, and Stripes in 1981, along with many more. Candy's children, Jennifer and Chris, also tweeted their support for the project. John's son, Christopher, confirmed the news of the documentary on Twitter, writing, This is all true, alongside a heart emoji so looking forward to working on this with them and our family this project is in great hands his daughter jennifer declared in a tweet in 2019 reynolds posted a tribute calling the beloved entertainer a canadian hero alongside a montage he made in candy's honor on the 25th anniversary of his death it's the 25th anniversary of john candy's passing we cooked up a small tribute to a comedic genius and canadian hero if you haven't seen much of his work take a look at his films he was a treasure a release date for the documentary has yet to be announced and this is awesome i absolutely love john candy love john candy great outdoors his little cameo in little shop of horrors his little cameo in home alone the kenosha kickers gus polinski i think it's the polka king of the midwest <laughs> Oh, man. I mean, this man is an absolute treasure. And Ryan Reynolds is absolutely right in declaring him so. Oh, man. This is such awesome news. I love hearing this. And the fact that Colin Hanks gets to direct this, knowing that his father and John Candy were best friends. This is unbelievable news. Incredibly positive. Cannot wait to hear more about this. When more details do come out, We'll be sure to discuss them here on the podcast, uh, such as a release date and when the filming does go officially into production. But knowing that this is in development now, incredible, absolutely incredible, and a much-deserved tribute. John Candy is an absolute legend, and Ryan Reynolds is right in saying that if you have not gotten the chance to see many of his films, be sure to check them out. You cannot go wrong. Uncle Buck, Stripes... Cool Runnings, uh, Spaceballs, and National Lampoon's Vacation, um, seeing him in, in Little Shop of Horrors and Home Alone, uh, Great Outdoors, Who's Harry Crumb, I, the list goes on. 
the list just goes on. You cannot go wrong with anything that John Candy worked on. Be sure to check out his films and also be sure to check out this documentary when it does arrive. What are your thoughts on this news though? Are you excited to hear that this documentary is currently in the works? What are your favorite John Candy films? Be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. All right, and our next topic today, Dune 2, the official release date has been announced. This comes to us directly from Screen Rant. The release date for Dune Part 2 has shifted once again. The upcoming Denis Villeneuve film is based on the epic Frank Herbert novel centering on a battle for control of the hostile planet of Arrakis, which contains a valuable resource known as Spice. In 1984, an adaptation of the novel starring Kyle MacLachlan and directed by David Lynch was released and largely received negative reviews. In 2021, a much-anticipated, high-budget adaptation starring Timothy Chalamet was released by Warner Media simultaneously in theaters and on HBO Max. The new Dune was a success that was nominated for 10 Oscars and won six of them. The 2021 adaptation of Dune covers half of the original novel, which is the first of six books in a series by Herbert. Dune Part 2 is set to cover the rest of the first novel, seeing the return of stars Chalamet, Rebecca Ferguson, Josh Brolin, Javier Bardem, Dave Bautista, and Zendaya, who will luckily get more screen time in the sequel. New introductions to the cast include Florence Poe, Lea Sado, Christopher Walken, and Austin Butler. Originally set for an October 2023 release date, Dune Part 2 was pushed back a month to November of next year, putting it in competition with the upcoming Hunger Games prequel, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Now, Warner Brothers reports that the film's release date has shifted once again. The release date has moved two weeks up from November 17th to November 3rd, 2023. The shift moves Dune 2 away from The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes' November 17th release taking the spot that was vacated by Marvel's Blade, which was recently delayed. The two-week shift allows Dune Part 2 to debut without major competition in the box office. This is exciting news. It sucks that with everything going on with Blade and the spot being open, Dune Part 2 taking full advantage of having no competition in that window, it's going to make a crap ton of money. That's what I anticipate, especially around November, December time. This time next year, I expected to make a ton of money, and rightfully so. Absolutely cannot wait to see part two of the story. Saw the previous 2021 release, I think at least three, if not four times in theaters. Absolutely loved it. Worth every single second of your time, and 100% deserving of 10 Oscar nominations and each of those six wins. Dune part two will be released November 3rd, 2023. What are your thoughts on this news? Are you excited to see Doom Part 2? Did you, have you gotten a chance to see the first film? If not, don't waste any more time. Be sure to check it out ASAP. You will not be sorry. It is visually stunning, incredibly epic story, and Part 2 is only going to be much more epic. Can't wait. All right, and our next topic today, Harrison Ford has officially been cast as Thunderbolt Ross in the MCU. This news comes to us from Deadline. It's official, Harrison Ford will be taking over the Marvel role of General Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross, beginning with the Phase 5 title, Captain America New World Order. He'll star opposite of Anthony Mackie with Shira Haas, Tim Blake Nelson, and Carl Lumbly also among the ensemble. Ford's Captain America casting had been in the rumor mill for some time now, with Jeff Snyder among those speaking to it of late. While the new film's plot is being kept under wraps, Mackie will reprise his role as Sam Wilson, who assumed the mantle of Captain America in Disney Plus's hit series, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Julius Ona will serve as the picture's director. Ford's General Ross is a top-ranking military official, first introduced in the Marvel Comics in 1962, who comes to lead the team of anti-heroes known as the Thunderbolts. 
the actor assumes the role played by Oscar winner William Hurt in films ranging from 2008's The Incredible Hulk through 2021's The Black Widow prior to his death in March at 71 years old. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier creator Malcolm Spellman wrote the script for the upcoming superhero picture with the show's staff writer Dallin Musson and will produce alongside Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige. Captain America New World Order is the fourth film set for Marvel's Phase 5, with titles including Thunderbolts and Blade to follow. The picture is slated for a release on May 3rd, 2024. Wow, this is awesome news and absolutely perfect casting. I know that another name thrown out there for a while was also Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott was also rumored to be in the running to replace uh, the late William Hurt as General Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross in the MCU. But knowing that Harrison Ford has, is now taking over the role, you cannot go wrong with either actor. But Harrison Ford is an incredible choice and one that I definitely did not see coming. Uh, but knowing that it was rumored the past week or so and knowing now that it is official Harrison Ford has been officially cast in the role and will be debuting in the role in Captain America New World Order, the fourth film set to release in Marvel's Phase 5. What are your thoughts on this news? Are you excited? What is your most anticipated upcoming Marvel project? And also, what is your favorite Harrison Ford project that he's ever been in? Be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. All right, and continuing with the Marvel news here, Blade has been shelved for now amid a director search. This news comes to us from MSN. In the wake of parting ways with director Bassam Tariq two weeks ago, the studio is now pressing pause on the vampire adventure thriller that is set to star Oscar winner Mahershala Ali. Marvel is temporarily shutting down production-related activities in Atlanta, where the film was set to have shot starting in November while it conducts a search for a filmmaker and further develops the feature. The studio is hoping to restart the production in early 2023, and after the publication of this story, Disney pushed Blade from its November 3rd, 2023 release to a release date of September 6th, 2024, one of a slew of changes due to the film's delay. Blade had seen its start of production shift a couple of times as it underwent several rounds of script rewrites. Bo DeMeo, who has worked on shows such as Star Trek Strange New Worlds, The Witcher, and his animated feature spinoff, as well as Marvel's own Moon Knight, is the current writer. When Tariq left the project, many presumed that a director would quickly be slotted into production that a director would be quickly slotted in so the production wouldn't miss too much time. But in, but in the two weeks that have followed, it became clear that Marvel wanted to slow down and deepen the search. By the same occasion, the studio thought it would take time to coalesce other aspects of the, of the feature project. They want to really get it right, says one source. Blade has been one of Marvel's most anticipated films since the studio announced the project to much fanfare at the San Diego Comic-Con in 2019. Yeah, I mean, I remember when they announced this film and they announced that Mahershala Ali was going to be Blade. I was incredibly, incredibly excited to hear this news. And ever since then, I have been incredibly underwhelmed and just upset by each bit of news that has come out as of late. Just no bit of good news. And just when it was about to start filming in November, the entire script was thrown in the garbage bin and the director left the project entirely. And now with them not being able to find a new filmmaker for the project and, and the new script being developed, it's no surprise that this film has been delayed, but it being delayed over a year and them having to shelve it for now, it just really stinks. <laughs> I was really looking forward to seeing this film next year, but knowing that it's another year out now in 2024, and it also shifts a bit of the timeline for MCU because everything's interconnected, and that's the one downside about all that too, is that with everything being interconnected over the shared universe in the MCU, 
it's no surprise that it's them mixing up uh, quite a few projects that were before this and also after it. And with that being said, it leads us to our next topic today, the Marvel Timeline Update. This also comes to us from MSN. Following the news that Marvel Studios was pushing pause on Blade as the studio searched for a new director, the studio's parent company Walt Disney shuffled its release date decks and came up with new slots for several highly anticipated blockbusters. Everything from Deadpool 3 to Fantastic Four has been pushed back, and now there's a significant gap between Avengers The Kang Dynasty in 2025 and Avengers Secret Wars in 2026. Here are the major changes that have occurred. Blade was previously slated for November 3rd, 2023, and has now moved to September 6, 2024, as we previously discussed. The upcoming movie Deadpool 3 was previously slated for September 6, 2024, and has now moved to November 8, 2024. Fantastic Four was originally slated for November 8, 2024, and has now moved to February 14, 2025. An untitled Marvel project slated for February 14, 2025, has now moved to November 7, 2025. Avengers Secret Wars was originally slated for November 7th, 2025 and has now moved to May 1st, 2026. And an additional untitled Marvel project slated for May 1st, 2026 has been removed from the upcoming schedule entirely. So now instead of racing to slot another movie in November 2023, a slot that had previously been occupied by Bleed for a good amount of time, Marvel is just simply deciding to release one less movie that year. And they already have Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and the Marvels on the docket. And now shifting everything back, it creates a larger delay for Fantastic Four, which is a movie that just now confirmed its director, but won't even reach theaters until February 2025. And really, it just puts an entire year between Avengers The King Dynasty and Avengers Secret Wars. So this is big news. And just by everything going on with Blade, the whole mix up with Blade has just shifted all the dates back and really uh, thrown a flux into things. But all the new dates are in line and they, they were able to figure out pretty quickly. But man, oh, man. It definitely would have been nice to have these movies a little bit closer together, especially not having a year between the Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars. It would have been nice to have those six months apart like we had with Infinity War and Endgame, but we'll see. We'll have to wait and see. Hopefully this all works out, and hopefully Blade is able to get its uh, crap together, but that remains to be seen. Any more news that does come out about the MCU, specifically any of its projects, we'll be sure to talk about it here on the podcast as always, but with these new dates confirmed, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on Blade being the one that pushed all these dates back for upcoming projects? As mentioned earlier here on the podcast, what is your most anticipated upcoming project for the MCU? And ultimately, how do you feel about some of these projects getting pushed back? Do you think it'll work out for them? What are your thoughts? Be sure to write to us and let us know. All right, and our next topic today, Deadpool 3 has officially been announced. This news comes to us from IGN. Deadpool will officially join the MCU and star Ryan Reynolds is teasing a long-awaited meeting with his old friend Wolverine in a surprise teaser posted on Ryan Reynolds' personal Twitter account. The actor is shown seated on a sofa telling fans that he was extremely sad about missing D23 and there was no Deadpool 3 announcement. Reynolds then shared a workout montage before taking a potential story idea the writers had for Deadpool 3. He then asks Hugh Jackman if he wants to play Wolverine again. Hugh Jackman briefly appears and says, Sure. Jackman last played Wolverine in 2017's Logan, directed by James Mangold. At the time, Jackman publicly stated Logan would be his last film as Wolverine. Even after Disney officially acquired the rights to the X-Men again, Jackman talked about his excitement for new actors to pick up the claws. However, a Jackman and Reynolds team-up has been something both actors have wanted to do for a long time, especially as a way to make up for their meeting in X-Men Origins Wolverine. And if Reynolds could reboot Deadpool, why not reboot his relationship with Jackman's Wolverine as well? The pair did briefly appear together in the credits of Deadpool 2, 
though it was more of a fun joke than a proper crossover. And well, now we are officially getting that crossover and it is very, very exciting to hear. This is awesome news. Absolutely cannot wait to see this film. And obviously we previously mentioned that it was originally state was originally slated for a September 6, 2024 release date, but is now moved back a couple of months to November 8th, 2024 for a release date. But knowing that this movie is in development and I, I honestly I cannot even imagine what is going to be how this is going to go. Um, I'm really hoping that they stay true to Deadpool with the character now joining the MCU. Hoping they stay true to how the character's been the first two. And honestly, just upping the ante with this next movie. Uh, knowing that Hugh Jackman's all in and returning in for the role of Wolverine. Simply awesome. Logan was a phenomenal film. And it's honestly due for a rewatch for myself. Knowing that he's coming back for the role. This, there's no better role for him to come back to, and honestly, I can I, I can definitely see why you said yes to come back for this. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. Cannot wait to see Deadpool 3, knowing that it was announced. If you haven't seen the announcement that Ryan Reynolds posted on his Twitter, be sure to check it out now. I think it's on, it should be on YouTube as well. Deadpool 3 is still about two years out, but officially in development. Hugh Jackman returning as Wolverine. What are your thoughts on this news? How excited are you? Have you seen the first two Deadpool movies? If not, be sure to check them out. Be sure to let us know your thoughts after you check them out. And also, be sure to let us know your thoughts on this news as well. Alright, in our next topic today, talking about some music news. Depeche Mode has officially announced a new album and a world tour. This news comes to us from Rolling Stone. During the peak of the pandemic, Depeche Mode's members found themselves simultaneously making sense of COVID's widespread loss while trying to appreciate life in the moment. Those two themes kept popping up when frontman Dave Gaughan and singer and multi-instrumentalist Martin Gore were writing lyrics for what would become their 15th studio album. They embraced the idea by calling the album Memento Mori. The direct translation for Memento Mori is Remember That You Must Die, Gone said via phone from Berlin a few days before the band's Tuesday press conference announcing Memento Mori. A lot of the songs are going into that place of reminding ourselves that our time is fleeting and you've got to make the best of it in a positive way. Gore says that he first heard the Latin phrase from a friend. I just thought, what a great album title for the songs that had been written already, he says. It's one of the few times the group has settled on an album title while making a record and stuck with it all the way through. The album, which producers James Ford and Marta Salogni are finishing in London, is due out next spring, while the Memento Mori tour will launch in North American arenas beginning in Sacramento on March 23rd. Before they could get in the studio, though, the title took a far greater meeting for Gone and Gore. On May 26th, Andy Fletch Fletcher, who co-founded Depeche Mode and played synthesizers and bass in the group since 1980, died naturally of an aortic dissection. Did they second guess the title after Fletch's death? I think it cemented it, if anything, Gore says. Obviously, everybody will think that all of the songs were quickly written after Andy died, Gore continues. Gore continues, but everything was planned and ready to go. Unfortunately, Andy passed away when he was really looking forward to getting started with us. So I like the idea of Memento Mori in a more positive way, in a live each day and make the most of your time here. Man, this is incredible news. And I'm just so excited, not only the opportunity to see them on a world tour again, but just to hear more music from Depeche Mode is just a true gift in itself. Depeche Mode, hands down, my favorite band of all time and the fact that we're going to get an all new brand new studio album the 15th studio album to come from Depeche Mode next spring this is just tremendous news curious to know what your thoughts are though are you a fan of Depeche Mode's music I know we talked about them and a few of their albums here on the podcast previously curious to know what your thoughts on their music and this news are Hey guys, just want to take a minute to give a major shout out and say thank you to the sponsor of this week's episode of the BMUs Reviews podcast, Marla Jean Boutique. 
If you are seeking a gift either for yourself or a loved one who finds value in handmade items, then look no further than Marla Jean Boutique. She has a collection of trendy handmade items including clothing, wine bags, jewelry, and much, much more. Use the promo code BMUSEREVIEWS10 at checkout to receive 10% off your entire purchase. Connect with Marla Jean Boutique on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Marla Jean Boutique, and be sure to visit their website at www.marlajeanboutique.com. And once again, be sure to use the promo code BMUSEREVIEWS10 at checkout to receive 10% off your entire purchase. And now, back to the podcast. All right, in our next topic today, we're going to get into some trailer talks, some new trailers that have recently come our way, starting off with Ant-Man 3, or officially titled Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. This film is set to officially kick off Phase 5 of the MCU, and this official teaser trailer looks absolutely bonkers. It seems that this whole film is going to take place, or at least a good portion of the film is going to take place within the quantum realm that we know that Scott was trapped in during the events after Ant-Man and the Wasp and where he was retrieved from in Avengers Infinity War, I believe. Either Infinity War or Endgame, honestly. It's, it's hard to recall exactly which one it was. I believe it was Infinity War. But... Knowing that he was retrieved from the quantum realm and see here in the trailer that the daughter sends a signal to the quantum realm. Obviously a big no-no. Don't want to do that. And it looks like someone got the message and they were sucked in and they have to find a way out if that's even possible. And at the very end we see the big bad villain, the one and only Kang. Kang the Conqueror appears at the end, played by the one and only Jonathan Majors. This is going to be an epic film. And I don't know. I know there was a different version of this teaser trailer that they showed at D23. And that version leaked online a few weeks back. And that specific trailer, you definitely get a much more... You definitely get a much more clear idea and interpretation of what Kang will be in this film and in future MCU films moving forward. Jonathan Majors is awesome choice in this role. And knowing that Ant-Man is going up against Kang in this film, I am nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> I am nervous. Don't want to mess with Kang. And he just seems terrifying in this film. And especially in the teaser that they showed at D23. They cut a few lines out and a couple snips out from the with the D23 trailer and tail. But this looks awesome. And it's going to arrive very soon. Within the next year, year and a half or so. And speaking of arriving soon. The upcoming horror thriller limited series Cabinet of Curiosities. The first trailer and first look of the upcoming series that will debut on Netflix from the mind of Guillermo del Toro has arrived. This was nuts. This has some gruesome imagery, some frightening jump scares, and it looks like all eight episodes, I believe it's, it might be six episodes, but I believe it's eight episodes, I could be wrong. The limited series looks incredibly unique incredibly creative and it's always twisted especially if it comes from the mind of Guillermo del Toro and just knowing that Guillermo del Toro is also involved in the upcoming Haunted Mansion film great move great move anytime Guillermo del Toro is involved in a project it gets my attention it's going to get my attention and you're going to pique my interest 10 times out of 10 and this trailer certainly did that and I'm looking forward to checking this series when it does arrive on Netflix. So be sure to check out the trailer and also be sure to check out the series. If you're a horror fan and you're a big fan of Guillermo del Toro, this is one you're not going to want to miss. I promise you that. And another trailer that has recently dropped, the Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special. Now, this is awesome that they're doing these holiday specials. I'm a real big fan of Werewolf by Night. We'll be sure to review that special later here in the podcast. Knowing that they're doing these like hour-long TV movie specials 
especially for like the holiday seasons, Werewolf by Night for Halloween, now Guardians of the Galaxy for the upcoming holiday season around Thanksgiving and Christmas time. This is just awesome. The trailer itself was really compelling and one that I will say that has me more intrigued than another upcoming holiday movie that recently released a trailer, which we'll talk about in just a minute here. But I would say that this film definitely grabbed my interest far more. And that's just because it's an MCU affiliated uh, movie and a, a TV movie and special, but the story overall just seems more compelling and much more interesting to me. Uh, personally, seeing Star-Lord very upset and depressed during the holiday season, he's all alone, and seeing the other members of the Guardians of the Galaxy band together, want to be there for their fellow friend and get him the greatest Christmas present of all time throughout the universe. I, I think it's really awesome. It looks like a really good story and it gives us a little teaser and a taste before Guardians of the Galaxy 3 does come out. And knowing that Guardians of the Galaxy 3, when it does arrive, it being the last time we're gonna see all of them on the big screen together, having this little uh, holiday teaser it's a perfect appetizer, and I will definitely take as much of them together on screen as we can possibly get. You can never go wrong with Guardians of the Galaxy. But if you haven't already, be sure to check out all three of these trailers. They're currently online now, and be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. All right, and continuing our talk with some new trailers that recently came out, our next set of trailers, starting with Violent Night, starring David Harbour as Santa Claus. But it's not what you think. This is this is the Santa Claus meets Die Hard. And yes, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. I will debate you to the end. Fight me. This movie looks bonkers. But it's right up my alley. I will watch this 10 times out of 10. This is the kind of movie that I'm so happy when studios take the chance and make something different, fun, unique, creative. Things that go, what in the world am I looking at? Yep. That's the movie that will get. <laughs> that's the movie that will get me in the theater 99.9% .9 of the time. I'm always looking for excuses to see a movie in theaters, especially if it's different, unique, and a story that simply hasn't been told before. You're gonna get me. You're gonna reel me in. And this is one that is definitely different and one that I've never seen anything like before. I am definitely looking forward to seeing this in December when it comes around just before the holiday season arrives. The next trailer recently released was for the Super Mario Brothers movie. This was awesome. I look in, even though it was just a simple teaser, I'm really looking forward to seeing this film. There are some incredible actors lending their voice to this project, and I'm really curious to see how it all plays out. The animation style looks phenomenal. I think the film looks great overall, and I'm curious to know where they're going to go with the story, knowing where so many of the different games have gone and i'm curious to see what sort of inspiration the the games have lent to this film which specific characters and worlds and uh, any sort of uh, story elements that that transition their way from the games to the big screen I'm curious to see what they are if any but if you haven't gotten a chance to see this trailer definitely be sure to check it out and be sure to check this movie out when it does arrive now our next and final trailer to discuss today was for Spirited, the upcoming holiday musical featuring Will Ferrell and Ryan Reynolds. This film was very different. Not sure what to expect at all. Um, really not sure what the story is. It looks like it's just like a different take on the, the Christmas Carol tale. For me personally, my taste is much more the violent night and seeing something different, wacky, uh, with David Harbour as the uh, mercenary Santa Claus that uh, just will unleash on anyone that uh, is on the naughty list, basically. And so I'd say that's definitely much more my speed. But the musical, uh, Spirited, it may be phenomenal. Who knows? Didn't really blow me away with the trailer that much. Sometimes a terrible trailer can be released for a really good movie. And you really can't judge a book by its cover, such as you can't judge a movie by from a bad trailer. So... I think it's always worth giving a film a shot and seeing it all the way through and then finally making your judgment based on that. But overall, looking forward to seeing all six of these projects when they do arrive. If you haven't gotten a chance to see these trailers, like I said, be sure to check them out. They're all online right now. And be sure to let us know your thoughts. All right, and switching gears to our next topic, 
we're going to now get into some of the reviews for this week's podcast. Kicking off the reviews for this week's podcast, we're going to look at the recent series, She-Hulk. Now, I was really not sure what to expect prior to jumping into this series. However, I can tell you that after watching it all the way through, I really rather enjoyed it. I really did. I can definitely say that I enjoyed She-Hulk far more than I enjoyed The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Hawkeye, and Miss Marvel by far. My personal opinion, I know a lot of people were big fans of uh, Miss Marvel. I'm still making my way through it. It's just, to me, it's just, it's okay. It's it's not, it's just nothing special to me, but that's my personal opinion. You may differ from that and that's okay. I think She-Hulk by far exceeds uh, expectations and also projects that I had just uh, mentioned. Now, were some of the episodes better than others? Yeah, definitely. But honestly, there were some moments in this series that had me absolutely dying. And, uh, and overall, I had a pretty good time watching the show. I'm also really looking forward to seeing season two, knowing that's in development, along with seeing how She-Hulk will factor into the MCU storyline moving forward. If you have not gotten the chance to see She-Hulk, be sure to check it out now, it's streaming exclusively on Disney+. Plus. And if you have gotten the chance to see She-Hulk and you watched it all the way through, what are your thoughts on the series? Be sure to write to us and let us know. All right, in our next review today, welcome to Wrexham. The series, welcome to Wrexham. Man, I gotta tell you, this series really caught me by surprise. I, and I think many people would say the same thing. Before watching this series, I had absolutely zero idea of what it entailed, other than the simple fact that it was a docu-series that featured Rob McElhenney and Ryan Reynolds, along with their newly acquired Welsh football club. That's all I had known. And as a viewer, the unbelievable journey that this series takes you on cannot be understated. It is tragic, honest, and supremely heartfelt throughout all 18 episodes. And I simply cannot recommend the series enough. If you have not already, be sure to check out Welcome to Wrexham, now available and streaming on Hulu. If you have gotten a chance to see the series and watch it all the way through, what were your thoughts? Be sure to write to us and let us know. All right, and our next topic today, our first film review for today, Hocus Pocus 2. Now, the synopsis for this film reads, Two young women accidentally bring back the Sanderson sisters to modern-day Salem and must figure out how to stop the child-hungry witches from wreaking havoc on the world. Look, was this the best film of the year? No, not even close. But was it fun and did I enjoy my time spent while watching it? Yes, absolutely. Being a 90s kid and growing up with the original Hocus Pocus film on repeat, I had a really fun time with this movie. I was also extremely impressed with by how all three main stars, Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and, and Kathy and Jimmy, all slipped right back into their respective roles, just seamlessly. I mean, it, it's, it was truly remarkable to see how not one of them missed a single beat. And it's been almost 30 years since the original film was released. If you're a fan of the original Hocus Pocus, you're definitely going to have a fun time watching this movie for sure. If you have not already, be sure to check out Hocus Pocus and the brand new Hocus Pocus 2 streaming exclusively on Disney+. All right, in our next review today, recently got a chance to see the movie Bros. This film's tagline reads, Two men with commitment problems attempt a relationship. I absolutely loved this film. Billy Eichner steals the show in this movie. And his on-screen chemistry with co-star Luke McFarlane was absolutely terrific. This film is hilarious. It's heartfelt. And it's a new age rom-com that you're definitely not going to want to miss. If you have not already, be sure to go to the theaters today. Do not miss your chance to see it in theaters. All right, in our next review today, Werewolf by Night. This TV film follows a lycanthrop superhero who fights evil using the abilities given to him by a curse brought on by his bloodline. I loved absolutely every second of this special feature TV movie. This was a refreshing, dark tale, which is surprisingly very brutal at times. It's also a great homage to classic cinema, specifically old-time monster movies. This TV movie is also accompanied with an epic mind-bending score 
from the one and only director composer Michael Cicchino and there is no doubt in my mind that this special feature TV movie will become an annual Halloween must-watch for myself and many others. If you have not already, be sure to check out Werewolf by Night, now streaming exclusively on Disney+. Plus. It's the perfect, perfect TV movie and perfect hour to spend for your Halloween this season. If you did get a chance to see Werewolf by Night, what were your thoughts? Be sure to write to us and let us know. All right, and our last film review for this week's episode, Halloween Ends. The synopsis for this film reads, The saga of Michael Myers and Laurie Strode comes to a spine-chilling climax in the final installment of this trilogy. I mean, wow. Where to begin with this one? Oh, this film is not at all what I expected it to be. Uh, nor do I think anyone else expected it to be anything like this. Very disappointing. Very disappointing film. Just really confusing. I wouldn't say it's terrible, but it's not good. It's not good. And people complain about Halloween Kills. Halloween Kills is at least a Halloween movie. This is not a Halloween movie. This was like, they almost like try to remake the Halloween 3 season of The Witch in a way. But I don't know. This is this is different. This was different. Not really my taste. Not my thing. Uh, this is definitely one of the worst Halloween movies I think I've ever seen. Um, not really much I can say else about that. Unfortunately, just this one wasn't for me. You know, not terrible. Just, but not good though either. That's just, yeah. It's on Peacock now. So if you don't want to go to theaters, you can. He's catching on Peacock if you have a subscription to that already. Yeah. But if you got a chance to see Halloween ends, what were your thoughts? Be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. All right. And for this week, we're going to take a look at some books to read before seeing the movie adaptation. Now, there's a lot of great books that are being made into movies. And a lot of those films are being released this upcoming year and also into 2023 and beyond. Some films have come out already, but... A lot of them um, that I'm interested in personally are coming up this year and also next year. So taking a look at some of those today and starting off with Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osagi Murders and the Birth of the FBI. The synopsis for this book read, In the 1920s, the richest people per capita in the world were members of the Osagi Indian Nation in Oklahoma. After oil was discovered beneath their land, the Usagi rode in chauffeured automobiles, built mansions, and sent their children to study in Europe. Then, one by one, they began to be killed off. One Usagi woman, Molly Burkhart, watched as her family was murdered. Her only sister was shot. Her mother was slowly poisoned, and it was just the beginning as more Usagi began to die under mysterious circumstances. Virtually anyone who dared to investigate the killings themselves were murdered. As the death toll surpassed more than 24 Osagi, the newly created FBI took up the case in what became one of the organization's first major homicide investigations. Eventually, the young director, J. Edgar Hoover, turned to a former Texas Ranger named Tom White to try to unravel the mystery. Together with the Osagi, they began to expose one of the most sinister conspiracies in American history, a true life murder mystery about one of the most monstrous crimes in American history. I absolutely cannot wait to read this book. I'm curious to know what actually went on and knowing that this is a true story and that's all actually occurred. And the film adaptation was, is in post-production currently, set for a 2023 release sometime next year starring Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, and Brendan Fraser, among others. Really looking forward to seeing the film adaptation, but also looking forward to reading this book before the adaptation arrives, and one that you should definitely check out. Next on our list, Cabin at the End of the World. The upcoming film adaptation is directed by M. Night Shyamalan and is titled Knock at the Cabin. The synopsis for this book read, seven-year-old Wen and her parents, Eric and Andrew, are vacationing at a remote cabin on a quiet New Hampshire lake. Their closest neighbors are more than two miles away in either direction along a rutted dirt road. One afternoon, as Wen catches grasshoppers in the front yard, 
a stranger unexpectedly appears in the driveway. Leonard is the largest man Wen has ever seen, but he is young, friendly, and he wins her over almost instantly. Leonard and Wen talk and play until Leonard abruptly apologizes and tells Wen, none of what's going to happen is your fault. Three more strangers then arrive at the cabin carrying unidentifiable, menacing objects. As Wen sprints inside to warn her parents, Leonard calls out, Your dads won't want to let us in, Wen, but they have to. We need your help to save the world. This synopsis reads exactly how the first artificial trailer plays out. Doesn't give you too much. I don't want to know anything more until I read this book, and I definitely want to read this book before I see the movie. Normally, I'm not big on that before horror movies and all that, but I'm so intrigued by this story, and it seems like a really good book, and I always love to give the book is shot before I see the film's adaptation because the film the film is obviously based on the source material and I always love to give the source material a shot first before seeing the film adaptation. So definitely put this on your list. It's on mine. If you have read the book already without any spoilers, be sure to let us know your thoughts. All right, next book on our list is Dune. The synopsis reads, set on the desert planet of Arrakis, Dune is the story of the boy Paul Atreides heir to a noble family tasked with ruling an inhospitable world where there is only one thing of value, the spice melange, a drug capable of extending life and enhancing consciousness. Coveted across the known universe, melange is a price worth killing for. When House Atreides is betrayed, the destruction of Paul's family will set the boy in a journey toward a destiny greater than he could ever have imagined. And as he evolves into a mysterious man, he will bring to fruition humankind's most ancient and unobtainable dream. Dune is an unbelievable story. I have the book currently. I'm making my way through it. And I'm looking forward to finishing it before Dune Part 2 comes out next November. An incredible story and definitely one to put on your list if you have not checked it out already. If you have, what are your thoughts on Dune? Be sure to write to us and let us know. All right, and last but not least, Ready Player One and Ready Player Two. Ready Player One is based in the year 2044, where reality is an ugly place. The only time where teenager Wade Watts really feels alive is when he's jacked into the virtual utopia known as the Oasis. Wade's devoted his life to studying the puzzles hidden in the world's digital confines, puzzles that are based on the creator's obsession with the pop culture of decades past and that promise massive power and fortunes to ever who can unlock them. But when Wade stumbles upon the first clue, he finds himself beset by players willing to kill to take the ultimate prize. The race is on, and if Wade's going to survive, he'll have to win and he'll have to confront the real world he's always been so desperate to escape. Unbelievable book, one of my favorite books of all time. I could not put it down, I think I finished it in like three days. Unbelievable book, and one that I highly recommend you check out, and then check out the film afterwards. The film is a bit different, and that's why I always say check out the book first, give it a shot, it's an unbelievable read. I'm currently making my way through the second book, so I'm going to hold off on reading the synopsis, but I know that it's based, the second book is based just a few days after the events of the first book. So I'll leave it there for you. Um, but definitely give these books a shot and some honorable mentions as well for some books that have been made into movies that have already come out that are definitely worth checking out. The Harry Potter series, of course, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, along with Jurassic Park and The Lost World by Michael Crichton absolutely unbelievable books all the way through and some of these books that we've mentioned here today their upcoming film adaptations doom part two killers of the flower moon cabin at the end of the world's film adaptation being knock at the cabin the upcoming m night Shyamalan film and ready player one being a steven spielberg movie that came out a few years ago and hopefully we see ready player two eventually made into a film as well with that being said these are books that you definitely can't go wrong with and definitely excited to see when their films do hit the big screen. And that just about wraps up this installment of the Beam Muse Reviews podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Musica. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Beam Muse Reviews, and be sure to listen 
every week on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, and all other streaming platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like, leave a comment, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to receive notifications that inform you exactly when our podcast and all other videos are out. And as mentioned, be sure to visit our website, www.musicoprojects.com. There you'll find all the links to our social pages, links to our latest podcast episodes, and also be able to read our latest blog posts as well. We'll be back next Friday with a new episode of the BMUSE Reviews podcast, so stay tuned for more. And as always, in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.